Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this morning. Thank you, Father, for the entrance of your word gives light. Lord, we pray this morning as we come to you, open our eyes, open our heart. Let there be illumination. Let there be revelation that will cause transformation in our hearts, O oh God. Help us to behold this word, O oh God, until we become it, O oh God. Thank you, Father, beyond what words can articulate. Let this word come forth in the language of everyone that will be hearing this morning, O oh God. Thank you, Father God, for making it please you to use this vessel of clay one more time to speak your word, O oh God. Have your way, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 How many of us have had the privilege of going to big corporations or opportunity to see someone who is highly placed, whether in politics or in the corporate world? One thing usually characterizes that meeting. Before you meet this important personality, you will have to go to security, you go to the secretary, and you get to a place where you wait before you actually get ushered in into the office of this particular person. And that place is called the waiting room. For most of us, that is not our destination. We want to see the prime minister. You want to see the premier. You want to see the CEO. You want to see the executive director. But then, before you see them, you have to go through some things before you get ushered into the presence of that person. And that place is the waiting room. And this morning, and do you know the funny thing about the waiting room? How many of us have been to Coles here? I'm sure all of us have been to Coles. Aldi, Woolies. Do you have to wait before you enter Coles? You're just walking. Because it is goals. But if you try that, even to the premier's office, some people will grab you. And before you know it, you have some explaining to do. Because he's the premier. Because that person holds a particular position. So when we are talking about the waiting room, you wait because you're about to see someone important or have an important encounter. That's why this morning, the title of my message this morning will be The Waiting Room, Valuable Lessons. From the life of Joseph. The waiting room. Valuable lessons from the life of Joseph. The waiting room. Valuable lessons from the life of Joseph. I want to make us understand one thing. That if you walk long enough with God. You will find yourself in the waiting room. Because uh, the God that we serve. Is more important than the prime minister. I'm sorry to disappoint you for a politician. Is much more important than the president of America. Is much more important than whoever is in charge of the world because those people they are seizing, they have time and season for whatever position they have. But when you walk with God long enough, you find yourself in a place called the waiting room. It is not your destination, but it is a place that will usher you to your destination. And the the life of Joseph captures this beautifully. That's why I would love to also examine the life of Joseph. To see how we navigated the waiting room. What he did in the waiting room. What happened to him in the waiting room. So that when we find ourselves there, we will not be complaining. We will not think God has forgotten. We will not think God did not speak. We will not think maybe I didn't hear God. We will not think maybe I'm going on my own frolic. The life of Joseph, if you permit me this morning, I will divide it into three sectors. Number one, the promise. Number one, the promise. Number two, the process. And number three, the palace. Number one, I said, the promise. Number two is the process. And number three is the palace. Daddy has taught us very well that without process, there can be progress. Without process, there can be progress. How many of us have eaten bread before here? Don't be shy. How many of us have just put up a little bit of eating bread? Did that bread just appear all of a sudden? What gave to bread? What, what gave rise to bread? Do, can we just go and eat yeast and say yeast or flour? We wake up in the morning, I'm going to eat flour. Something is not quite right. So also, most of us drive. You go to the petrol station, you buy petrol. Or you buy diesel, depending on what sort of car you drive. But I put it to you, it didn't start as petrol. It didn't start as diesel. There is something called crude oil. Isn't it? 
Have you ever tried to put crude oil in your car before? What will happen? It will knock the engine. But in that same crude oil, there is petrol there. There is diesel there. There is aviation fuel there. You have to process it before it gives you what you want. So also, the things God has designed and purpose for us, if he gives it to us in the quantum that is coming from heaven, it will suffocate us. We can't digest it. So we need process. So the beauty about process is that process is the bridge between the promise and the palace. Are you with me? Process is the bridge between the promise and the palace. The funny thing is that it may look as if when you get the promise, oh, God has given a particular word. For most Christians, we think automatically, oh, it's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen straight away. No, that is an invitation. Son, I will do something. Daughter, I will do something. Remember Genesis chapter 12. When God spoke to Abraham, he gave him all the promise. I will, I will. Did it happen in chapter 13? Did it happen in Genesis 13? It took a while. It was a journey. So also, for example, if you are invited to a particular occasion, does the invitation become tantamount to attendance? When you get an invitation, there's something at the bottom of the invitation. It's called RSVP. Responsive will play. Reply if you please. So also, in our work with God, process is your RSVP. When you go through process, process will determine whether I'll be a partaker of that party or not. But most of us, we take the invitation card and say, it is done. Oh, God has said this. I'll go and fall asleep. I'll go and sit down. No. It gives you a vision. It gives you a dream. That is not the time to fall asleep. That is not the time to go to bed. That is time to roll up your sleeve and work it out. Amen. And even in the natural, the promised land is not next door to the palace. I'll say it again. The promised land is not next door to the palace. Let's come to geography. Let's keep it simple. How many of us know Egypt? Egypt, current day Egypt is in North Africa. True or false? True. Current day Israel. Where is Israel? It's in the Middle East. Is Middle East in Africa? I've never been to Egypt before, but I know my geography. They are not next door neighbor. So if God can promise the Israelite a promised land that is not next door to Egypt, it is a sign for us that your promised land, your palace, is not next door to the promise. To, to the promise. Do we understand? So when God gives you a promise, don't think that Monday God gives you a promise and Tuesday it will happen. Miracles can happen, but miracle is not the modus of operandus for the children of God. Because the Bible says the just shall live by. The just shall live by. I thought it was said miracle in your Bible. No. Faith. The anointing is, is for ministry. The, the, you don't live by anointing. You live by faith. And faith is the vehicle that will carry you through when you are going through your process. Amen. I'm giving this background for us to have an understanding of why the waiting room. Because you'll be like, is it God? Is, he made heaven and earth. Why can't he just call it forth? Why can't he just call my promotion forth? Why can't he just call that thing forth? Why can't he just do it straight away? He can do it. But then, how many of us know people who want something now and they can't wait? Who are those? Children, thank you. God bless you. If a child wants to eat, it does not matter whether you are in the bus or you are in the train or you are in the pram. When hunger comes, duty calls. You must obey. Otherwise, there will be commotion in that place. But as we grow in Christ, you will ask for something of the Lord. He will have finished it. But he will want you to be prepared for what he has prepared for you. He will want you to be ready so that you don't miss it. That is why he will send you to a place called the waiting room. Called the waiting room. Come with me to Genesis chapter number 37 this morning. Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter 37. That will be our main text this morning. We'll look at the life of Joseph. We'll look at the promise. That for, now from the foundation which we're going to build on as we look at the waiting room. What he did and how he navigated it. Genesis 37. We'll start from, we'll read verses 1 to 11. Come with me, say. 
Now, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. Can you imagine? Even that verse 2 itself is, is pregnant with meaning. Say, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17, was Joseph the firstborn? What happened to number 1 to 10? Were they not alive? But he's saying, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years, something about Joseph made him stand out. So, even before any dream came by before any coat of many colors came by. there was something about this joseph that made him stand out although it was number 11. let's read on and the lad was with the sons of bilha and the sons of zilpa his father's wife and joseph brought a bad report of them to his father now israel loved joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age also he made him a tunic of many colors. Some translation will say coat of many colors. Let's continue. But when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. It was not the coat that was the problem. It was the character. It, it was the destiny. You will find out. Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. This is when Pedro now entered fire. He just became, just took off. Now Joseph had a dream. And he told this to his brothers. And they hated him even more. Wow. Verse 6. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Verse 8. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream. By the mouth of two or three, every word shall be established. He dreamed another dream. And he told this to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Verse 11. And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. We'll stop there. It's a long read. But I'm sure we know the story very well. This is just to give us a premise. We can see Joseph was only 17. But there was something about Joseph that made him stand out right from the outset. Most, I want to talk to young people this morning, even before we get to the waiting room. Seven, most 17 year old these days, they are just going with the fairies. They are occupied with so many things. He was 17, but he had a sense of purpose. He was 17 and he was, his brothers were older than him, yet he was the one that was telling his father, these people are not doing the right thing. He was conscious. He, he, he knew that his life was for a particular purpose. So don't ever think that I'm only 15. I'm only 13. I'm still 17. I have time. Most 17 are busy playing with... Is that, that was that board that they roll around the street now in the CBD. That's all they do. Playing around all manners of hairstyle, wasting time doing tattoo. That is not the reason why you are made. There's a purpose. You are not too young to get into purpose. You are not too young to serve God. You are not too young to know God because... You remember the Lord your God in the days of your youth when evil day has not come. Invest into your future. Invest into because a time will come. You won't have all the strength of you that you have. So youth, beware. He was 17 but was disciplined. And we'll see further what he did at 17. So he brought bad reports about his brother. And because he stood out, what did his father do? He got him a coat of many colors. But that was not the real problem. But this man was just different in his way. He was young, but the hand of the Lord was upon him. And what happened? He had this dream. This dream sounds very fantastic and very good. One would have thought all of a sudden Joseph would become king and they would say, bow to the king and everything. But that was, not the, that was not the way it worked. God sent him from that place, from that dream. If you read straight away, it was a problem that followed. What happened straight away? His brother sold him. If you look at the story, because of time, I won't read it. But what happened was that immediately... After he had that dream, the Bible says his brothers, his father sent them to the field 
to go and feed the sheep at Shechem. And maybe they, let's go there. Let's go there. Genesis 37, verses 12 to 12. Verses 12 to 14, I beg your pardon. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. 13. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in, the, in Shechem? Number one, before we go further, before they used to go together. But because he was always going, coming back to report them, they said, Daddy, don't let Joseph follow us today. He's the one that will talk, talk, talk. He will come and tell us everything, everything that happened. He will come, he's, he's, you know, his mouth cannot keep secret. So they, they left him at home this time around. But his father said, Israel said to Joseph, I know your brother's feeding the flock in Shechem. Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Verse 14. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. The first thing I want to point out is that the waiting room is God orchestrated. Joseph was home this time around because he was not jailing, quote and unquote, with his brothers. He was minding his business. His father called him, Joseph, go to Shechem, go and see what's happening to your brothers. And he didn't say, Daddy, those people don't like me. I don't want to go. Daddy, it's not convenient. It, it is 5 a.m. It is whatever. The Bible says, he obeyed. He went. The Bible did not tell us that a servant was sent with him. How old was he then? Excuse me. He was 17. Such a responsible 17 year old. The distance from where they were to Shechem is about 50 miles. 50 miles, 50 times 1.6. That we're talking about probably 80 kilometers or thereabouts. 17 year old boy. Can you see how level headed and trustworthy this young man was? Let's read further. Read verse 15. You see what he did. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? Verse 16. So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. 17. And the man said, they have departed from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Word of advice. Counsel. They left home to go to where? Shechem. Did they tell their father they are going to go to Dothan? Don't let's be like this Joseph's brother. You leave home. I'm going to St. Albans. The next thing you are in Glen Waverly. The next thing you are in Point Cook. The next thing you are in uh, Shepparton. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. They left home for Shechem and Dutton. Do you know the distance between Shechem and Dutton? is 15 miles, 24 kilometers. So they were not anywhere close to home at all. They are left home. And if Joseph was not a responsible boy, who cares, who has a heart of service, he would have said, Daddy told me to go to Shechem. I didn't find them there. Me, I'm going back home. What is my business? They didn't even like me anyway. So, tit for tat. No! He went out of his way to look for, to look for them. And he found them in Dothan. Dothan was a port that was close to where the slave traders were. It was, it was a transshipment route. But although he was just doing what Jacob had sent him, but he was actually doing the will of the Father in heaven. Because it was a divine setup. And that is one thing. Daddy told us last week, was, uh, I think he was doing the prayer that if you are too small for a, if you are too big for a small thing, you will ultimately be too small for a big thing. If I say, let me say it again. If you are too big for a small thing than me, send me to Sheke, a whole me, Joseph, can't you see my coat of men? It is, it is Versace. You are undoing yourself. He went to Shechem. He did not know that destiny, if you are told, Daddy, I'm, see, I have, I'm having the flu, he will have missed destiny. We will see. That's why you have to be careful. Big things start small. Start small, grow big. The only thing that starts from the top, do you know it? Do you know it? Who knows? It's only the grave that starts from the top. Start from the bottom. Start, build small. Trust God to make you big. Don't I want to start from the CEO. The CEO of the, it doesn't work that way. You don't become prime minister. You become MP. You become delegate. You become volunteer. You do all those things. Little by little, you build until, where, until you get to where you're going. And just to prove to us that it was the father that orchestrated his waiting room, let's look at Genesis 39 verse 1. Genesis 39 verse 1. The f Genesis 39 verse 1. So the first thing about the waiting room is that it is God orchestrated. The father orchestrates the waiting room. It's not the enemy. The father orchestrates. Let's, he says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt 
and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelite who had taken him down there. Question, why was it that of all the people in Egypt who could buy Joseph, why was it that was Potiphar that bought him? People who had wealth, people who were of means, were the ones who were buying slaves in those days. But because God knew that destiny awaited in the house of Potiphar and Pharaoh, ultimately, he had to position Potiphar to be there that day when they were selling. And of all the slaves that were there, it was Joseph that his eyes said, this one I want. He was sold. Who would have thought that God was in that business for Joseph? Remember, one day he was wearing coat of many colors. Life was very good. He was above board. The next moment, he went out of his way to look for his brothers. And the only welcome they could tell him was that, let's kill him and see what will become of his dream. What did they do when he landed to them? He landed at their destination. What did they do? They stripped him and they put him in a pit that had no water. And then Judah negotiated that out. There's no point. Don't let a hand be on this man. Let's sell him. And they sold him like a commodity. Their brother. He wasn't a neighbor. He wasn't an aunt. He wasn't an uncle. He was brother. They played together in the backyard. They do all manners of things together. And yeah, these people sold him. So don't be disappointed when people close to you betray you. It might be God setting you up. They might have broken your heart, but God knows how to make it up to you. So don't let, don't look unto men. Look unto God because God has a way to make all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. He, because he, he was so dis. I mean, I would just put myself in the place of Joseph. I mean, he's gone out of his way, and all of a sudden, no welcome, no thank you for the grocery. Boo! Take off your clothes. Boo! Pit, boo, sell. I mean, it would be too much for him, but somehow God kept him. So the first point about the waiting room is that it is orchestrated by the Father. And to let us know that the waiting room is not always attractive, it's not always palatable, please come with me to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, verses 17 to 19. I want to show us what the scripture said about how Joseph got to Egypt. We all know that he was sold. He went, he went as a slave. But how did he actually get there? He sent he, capital E, that is God, right? Not man. He sent a man before them. Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Verse 18. They hurt his feet with feathers. He was laid in irons. Verse 19. Until the time that the word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. He didn't tempt him. He tested him. When the Bible says they hurt his feet with fetters, do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? He was in chains. So, he, he was not even a refugee. At least refugee will come by boat. And if they can escape, can swim, they will get here. He was in chains. He was a proper prisoner. Who would have thought in their wildest dream that God was in that situation? Who would have thought? I'm sure people would have mocked him. That, look at this. Look at this. I'm sure he must be evil. He's, he's, you know, Finally, justice has caught up with him. Just like they, took, they said about Paul, that look, when was the Melita? When was the Melitus? When snake held fastened to his hand, I thought, yeah, finally, judgment has caught up with him. What I'm trying to say is that at times when you're in your waiting room, things will look really bad. Really, really bad. And you wonder, how did I get here? You wonder, have I not been serving God? You wonder, my mates are overtaking me. People who, do, who have done half of what I've done, they are better than me. It will look as if you are losing. It will look as if you're about to be embarrassed totally. But just hang on. See how it will end. The second point about the waiting room is that the presence of God will always be evident. The presence of God will always be evident in the waiting room. Genesis 39 verse 2. Genesis 39 verse 2. The presence of God will always be evident even in the waiting room. Genesis 39 verse 2 says, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. That is a very interesting verse. If you can stay on just that verse too. The Lord was with Joseph. Do you know that all the time his coat of many colors was happening? The Bible didn't tell us that the Lord was with him. But just to tell us that God has not slept on the job. Just to tell us that regardless of what people are saying about you, about your situation, God is with you. And it was, the Bible says, it was a successful man. What, we, what is your definition of success this morning? I don't think you call him successful if he was living in 2022. If he was a slave. 
No wife, no job, no education, no nothing to his name. The only thing was, was a slave. But the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. So what you need to be a success, I'm not saying don't go to school, I'm educated. But what you need to be a success is the presence of the I am that I am. The one who made heaven and earth. When he's with you, you cannot go astray. It might look that you're not getting there, but you will get there. Because the Bible says, now are we sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, it might look as if you're going nowhere. But remember, daddy taught us, it is not what people say about you that will come to pass. It is not what God, but it is what you say you agree with him. So, don't let the noise from the city distract you. Don't let their chatter dissuade you. Don't let their aggression cause you to be afraid. Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Just hold on to that promise. It may not look like it, but he's coming. He that will come, will come and he will not tarry. Amen. So, he, the Lord was with him and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So, it was clear that even in his dungeon, in his adversity, the Lord did not abandon him. The Lord was with him. The third thing about the waiting room is that your environment will be blessed because of you, but not for your sake. I'll say it again. When you're in the waiting room, your environment will be blessed because of you, but not for your sake. Let me rewind. Do you know what that means? Let's see what happened in the house of Potiphar. Come with me. That's Genesis 39 again, verses 5 and 6. So it was, pay attention, from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Verse 6. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph won handsome in form and appearance. Look at it. Potiphar was blessed not because he attended church, not because he feared God, not because he was righteous, but because of a man called Joseph. But how much of this blessing transpired or translated to Joseph? How much of it? None. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. Because of Joseph's association and engagement in the affairs of Potiphar, Potiphar became blessed. And this is a vital lesson. Be careful of your associations. Be careful of your friendship. Be careful of who you roll with. There are some people you roll with, you begin to drown. Don't look too far. Remember Jonah. The people in that boat, they were going on that journey, Jejeli, and Jonah came. If you're on a journey with Jonah, God help you. Be careful. You can, everybody cannot be your friend choose your friend wisely make sure the Holy Spirit is leading you it doesn't matter whether it's a handsome man or a beautiful man or a nice guy or you can talk politics or you can talk economy or you can talk sport choose your friends carefully because of Joseph all of a sudden Potiphar boom they will say Ohama all of a sudden Potiphar was everything was going for Potiphar how difficult and painful will it have been for Joseph at that point but the Bible did not tell us that Joseph stole anything from Potiphar. Do you know that when money is little, if you steal it, they will catch you. But when money is so plenty that you can't even know where it is, if you take a little bail, nobody will know. Nobody, because at this point, if you read further, the Bible told us that Potiphar did not know what he had except what was given to him because there was so much money. The money was so, there was blessing everywhere. Yet, Joseph did not say, I've served this man, God, very well. He's not being good to me. Let me, heaven help those who help themselves. Psalm 500 verse 1. You know, he didn't help himself and say, let me start taking something so that the day I would plot my escape, I'll have something to hold on to. So it does not matter if the person you are working for is maltreating you. If the person that's supposed to be helping you is taking advantage of you, don't worry. Heaven sees and heaven knows and is taking record of it. When God will repay you, he will repay you well. But the own mistake we make that we are not patient enough on God. You will take matters into your own hands. When you allow God to fight for you, he will fight for you. He will fight for you well. When he fights for you, you will pity your enemy. When he does the fight for you, you will be amazed. You will be begging for mercy for your adversary. But most of the time, we can't wait on him. We are too hasty. Like, hey, hold me. Don't you know who I am? Who are you? 
You are just a human being. But when the one who made him, the one who is the maker of the exploiter, shows up to him, he will bow. When the Kadnezah saw the God of Shedah, Bishad, and Abed, what did he do? A whole king. He bowed, he bowed down before them because he saw the power of God. He saw the hand of God. Amen. The next thing that happens in the waiting room is that, number four, you will be tempted and pressured. You will be tempted and pressurized. You will be tempted. Let's look at verse 7 to 10. Verse 7 to 10. Oh, that's in scripture. Isn't it? And it came to pass, after these things, that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? If we read further, you will see that. Let's continue, verse 10. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not eat to her. So Mrs. Potiphar did not say it once and go. What did the Bible say she did? Day by day, she was a persistent adversary. She was a persistent saboteur. She was ready to finish this man called Joseph. That he did not heed to her to lie with her or to be with her. Verses 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. Verse 12. That she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. What pressure. This was Joseph. He was in a place he could have taken advantage. If Mrs. Potiphar had asked once, one would have understood that outcome was just a little bit of temptation. It was proper temptation every day. Boss is why every day. The woman was just pressurizing this poor man. Because the enemy had seen that I can't get this man to steal. He will not take the money. He will not sabotage his boss. Let me see whether he has controlled his flesh. Whether he has mastered his flesh. The enemy will come for you. I'm not, I'm not prophesying, I'm not a prophet of doom. When you go high enough, he will come for you. He will, not look for, he will look for you. And we can see here, the Bible did not tell us that Joseph was praying. What did Joseph do? What did he do? Tefi, tefi, he ran. He did not wait. Because when Mrs. Potiphar shows up at your doorstep, the only thing that will save you is your two legs. You must run. If you don't run, you'll be in trouble. Mrs. Potiphar is dangerous. And Although Mrs. Potiphar is dead, there are representatives everywhere. Beware. They will come for you. The very day your promotion is around the corner, you want to come and scatter it for you. You might be gunning for whatever position. And you come and say, ah, what about that affair in 2000 or whatever? Like, ah, my show. You don't want that to be your portion. You have to be careful. She was persistent. I mean, Joseph had every right to fall. Do you know we were not told that Joseph was going to Bible study in Egypt. I don't think his God will have allowed him to go. But he had the Holy Spirit who was helping him. And he said, shall I do this and sin against God? He had the consciousness of presence with him. I was like, I cannot do this. You see, you are not a thief until you can steal and nobody will catch you and you refuse to do that, you, that you, you pass. If you do it, if you don't steal because everybody's there, it's easy now because like everybody, they go see me. Church people are here. Church people are here. Hey, if pastors should come now, you know, but when it is you and God and your two years, you know that if I do it, but you know the Lord is very faithful and the devil is also very crafty he knows how to plant somebody there, you will, have, you will think and there can never be anybody from church, this is far this is uh, Afghanistan all of a sudden you say, oh sister so and so you will shake like, hi, what happened here, it is because the enemy want to sabotage your future because the thing is for everyone who fulfills destiny, you are a pain in the neck of the enemy. So he will do, he will stop at nothing to sabotage you. So it was not about Mrs. Potiphar, you know. It was about Joseph's destiny. It was about the children of Israel. So he was contending for the destiny of a nation. That's why he refused. So people that will break nations, people that will, that will be able to bring nations out of all manners of adversity and chaos, they are people who have conquered the flesh. And the flesh can be very difficult to conquer my people. Go and ask Apostle Paul. As spiritual as he was, he had his own to say. Look at Peter. He was boastful. 
Even if everybody, you know, if everybody says they don't know you, me, it's me, it's me, it's Peter. I, nah, I will not deny you. But when the robber meet the road, what did Peter do? Ah, you know, this one. I mean, I'm not dying today. Uh, see, I can still live. Fishing is still there. Until God had to come and restore him. Come and do a walk in him. That was when he was able to stand. All I'm telling us is this. When you find yourself in a waiting room, you will find opportunities to compromise. Please don't compromise. You might be waiting to God for your husband or for his spouse. And then that's when one cheeky babe will come to come and cause you trouble. And this cheeky babe will, will be, she'll be in your office. She might even be in your school. And she all of a sudden she'll just like you. She just liked the way you dress. Even if you dress shabbily, oh, you're looking nice today. And your head is starting to become number two, starting to grow big. It is Wahala that is any signature to you. Run, run. Because you need to remember there's a future in God. God does not owe any man. God will pay. He does not pray every day. He does not pray every week or every fortnight. But when God pays, you know that he has paid. So when you're in your waiting room, stay there. Everybody around you might be getting married. You might have gone to, what do you call it now? Ends party. You might have gone to 10 of them. You might be the professional bridesmaid. Wait for your own husband. He that will come, will come and not tarry. Don't be in a hurry. You have only one life to live. Live it well. Live it for God. Live it for purpose. Live it for destiny. And the man too, don't rush. Just wait for him. You don't want to marry the wrong person. It's a lifetime of pain. Wait on God. Wait, and we live in a generation now that it is almost popular to be wayward. It is popular to be wayward. They will say things to make you look like a reject. Don't mind them. Face your race. Don't mind them. They can call you names. They can call you mother of Jesus. They can call you Mary or Martha. Whatever. Don't compromise. When they are doing their thing, stand in righteousness. Stand erect. Because God will remember you and will reward you. Amen. Amen. Number five. The fifth thing that happens in the waiting room. You will be cheated, maltreated, and paid evil for your good. You will be cheated, maltreated, and paid evil for your good. What happened in verses? Let's read on to verse 16. Verse 13. And so it was, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, he fled outside. Think for me with him for a moment. That day, I don't, I've never been to Israel before, but I can imagine whatever it was, maybe a tunic or something. She ripped the thing. Joseph did not say, Madam, please give me my shirt. Oh. Please give me my shirt. Oh, guy is coming up. Oh. Please give me my shirt. What did the man do? The man ran. He could have, because every, and the other thing was that, I'm sure people in the house knew that Joseph was innocent, but nobody spoke up for him like, God catch you, that Hebrew boy. When did he come? I was the most senior slave in the house before he came. Now, he came from, he, from just that Hebrew place. All of a sudden, he's the boss. In your workplace too, they won't like you because of the favor of God. They will envy you like, when did he come? I've been in this job for 15 years. He came two years ago and he's now the boss. And he will come and say, you, what are you doing? And they'll be making all kinds of things. And so, the day adversity comes, nobody will speak up for you. They will leave you alone. Be like, ah, ah, Sarah, Sandra, I thought you are my friend, but you saw it now. I didn't do it now. They, everybody will just keep quiet. They'll look like, nah, 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 nah. They just, Sorry, I can't help you. This is beyond me. They will leave you alone. And you'll feel embarrassed. What happened further? Verse 14. Verse 14. That she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew. All of a sudden, he has brought into us. When did us come from? This is the language of people who want to call division. Divide and rule. He has brought to us. All of a sudden, Joseph is a Hebrew. When he was making money for them, when they had too much money in their account, he was not a Hebrew. But all of a sudden, when they want to finish him, Oh, he's, he's a foreigner. He's a migrant. He's a whatever. They use all manner of, he's a whatever. They use all manners of things to cause segregation. He brought to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me and I cried out a loud voice. And it happened. When he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Wow. 17. Then she spoke to him with words like this, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened. As I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. Let's stop there for now. Was that true? Big lie. Big fat white lie. Nothing but garbage. 
But Potiphar chose to believe that. He didn't give me a second chance that this man, I've known you for a little bit. He didn't steal my money. I have increased it on all sides. Why will he be like that? But for whatever reason, he was maltreated, he was cheated, and he was paid evil for good. Let's see. The next thing that happened, number six thing that happened in the waiting room is that you, the code to the next level is called disappointment. The code to the next level in the waiting room is called disappointment. The code to the next level is called disappointment. What did Potiphar do after all of this? Let's read to 21 now. Let's read to 21. So it was when his master heard this word, which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the law, wow, can you see again? Every time Joseph ran into turbulence, God always shows up. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Can we see? When you are ready to be promoted, get ready for a disappointment. When disappointment comes, don't, don't curse your blessing. It might just be God trying to position you, trying to relocate you. You might lose a job today. And be like, oh, how am I going to pay my bills? What is going to happen? It is because there's a better one. If God allowed that job to go, it's because a better one is coming. If God allowed that man to guilt you or that woman to guilt you, it's because a better one is coming. If God allowed all your effort to fail, it's because something better is around the corner. Can you imagine? He served Potiphar well. And the only thank he could get was called, go to prison, boy. I mean, that was callous. Very bad. You will have thought, this boy is not going to go anywhere. I wonder what people will say in the other. Finally, that boy was too arrogant. I knew it. I knew it was going to fall. People would have all manners of tongues wagging. He ended up in prison. But prison was the next phase of the assignment. Who would have thought that it was God that was using prison? Of all things. I'm sure if he woke up that morning and had prison in his prayer, he would have said, I bind you devil. It's not me. It's my enemy that will go to prison. Most of us, we are praying prayers that we don't have to pray. We keep binding and losing the devil. And the devil is like, for once I'm innocent. It is God that is orchestrating it. You don't know how many times you'll be disappointed. Every disappointment is for a better appointment. You might have lost it today. You will gain it tomorrow. Because you might, it might look as if it's gone. It is never gone. Because God is the one who created time. Your time is in his hands. So don't let anybody tell you that. Your time, you are 40. You still have no husband. Oh, it is finished with your party. No, it doesn't work that way. God will remember you. At the appointed time, he will come to you. And he will do that we have said he will do. One will have thought at this point, Joseph will have had enough of God. That God, you keep promising, you, keep, you don't deliver. God, God, I'm going on my own. And it's very easy to justify that. God, I've trusted, I've trusted, that nothing happened. But what happened? He didn't leave God. He stuck to that God. He stuck to that God, even in the prison. The next point, number seven, which I want to bring us that the Lord is already waiting for you. Hence, he allowed the disappointment. We can see that every time you find, when you are in the waiting room and you experience disappointment, it is because the Lord is waiting for you. You know, our God is a God who makes provision before the need arises. Do you know that before he put Adam and Eve in the garden, what did he do to that garden? Exactly. Everything they needed was ready in that garden. So if you find yourself in a place that's unpalatable, as long as I'm the child of God, I put it to you, God is waiting for you there. Remember the three Hebrew boys. What happened? What happened with Nebuchadnezzar? The men who were putting them in the fire, what happened to the men? They died because the fire was hot boy, really hot. However, when they landed in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not throw three men in the fire? I see a fourth man and his look looks like the son of God. When he allows the fire, it's because the son of God is waiting for you in that fire. And when the son is in the fire with you, he cannot burn you. The only thing that God burned that day was the chain that was holding them down. So when you find yourself in the fire, it's to purify you. It's to take away your chains. It's to take away those things that will make you mess up in future. It's to make you better. It is because when you come out of that fire, Nebuchadnezzar will bow before you. So just wait. The fire cannot bond you. Because if you look at Isaiah 43, what does he say? Let's go to Isaiah 43. Just briefly, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. 
Isaiah chapter number 43. But now, thus says the Lord, who created the old Jacob and he who formed the old Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So this morning is telling somebody, fear not. They might proclaim fire, he seen refinement. He might proclaim fire, he seen destiny. He seen purpose. Amen. If you look at it, the next thing that happens in the waiting room, this can be a bit difficult, can be difficult, is that when you are in the waiting room, you are, in, you are busy interpreting the dreams of others. When your own dream is on ice, it's frozen. You are busy helping other people where your own is just on one side, in the cooler. Let's look at what happened to Joseph. I'm sure we know the story very well. That's in Genesis 39, 7 to 8 and verse 23. It was Genesis 39, 7 to 8. Genesis 39, 7 to 8 and verse 23. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, if we can skip that, we can go to verse 23. Let's go to 23. Sorry about that. Let's go to 23. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Let's continue. What happened was that when he found himself in prison, two officials of Pharaoh, the butler and the baker, were in prison. And the Bible said, at Joseph looked at the countenance of them and said, why is your face like this? What happened? And they told him that he had a, they had a dream that was not parallel. And he began to interpret the dream and he gave, he gave interpretation to the dream of both the butler and the baker. And because, first he gave the interpretation for the one of the butler. And because the baker saw that he was good, he went to him and said, what about my own dream? And exactly as he said, the dreams came to pass. The butler was released and the baker was executed according to the interpretation of Joseph. This, and Joseph told the butler, when you get to the palace, please remember me. Did the butler remember him? Not at all. He just forgot him completely. Disappointment. This was his own ticket out of jail. Finally, op open doors come. And all of a sudden, the devil closes the open door. What do you think will happen to Joseph? He will have been disappointed. He, at least they should have paid him back and said, this man, get him out of prison. Just give me clemency. Let him go. But what happened? No. Nothing happened. He was interpreting dream of others. His own was going nowhere. He was supposed to be a ruler. He was supposed, people were supposed to bow him down to him. But he was inside prison. Becoming senior prefect. Inside there. Nothing was happening in his life. He was there. And the Bible says, after two full years, something happened. God now planted a dream in the heart of Pharaoh. And the dream troubled him so much. Troubled him so much. Nobody could interpret it. All of a sudden, the butler remember, oh God, there is one Hebrew boy. I forgot two years ago. He, can, he, he knows everything. He can fix the problem. And the last thing that happens in the waiting room is this. The waiting room ushers you into the palace. The waiting room ushers you into the palace. Genesis 41. We'll just read 14 to 16 because of time. We could have read everything, but we don't have the time. What happened there? Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. They brought him quickly, not uh, dragging them, quickly out of the dungeon. What is a dungeon? Living room, uh, penthouse, air condition. I mean, what is coming to me is the Yoruba interpretation. In Ajale, it's underground, like proper hot. He was not a palatine. They brought him out quickly. And he shaved. Changed his clothing. Came to Pharaoh. 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream. And there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you. That you can understand a dream to interpret it. Verse 16. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. This was a man who had been processed. He was not saying, ah, yes, we are, we, are, we are the one. We are the interpreter. We are the one. Yes, I, actually, I interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar two years ago. I was with uh, Scott Morrison two years ago. Now I'm here. Yes, yes, yes. I charge a fee. This is a fee, consultation fee, $500. And then uh, admin fee, $200. So can you please, my POS is here. No! He said, it is not in me. Because he had gone through processing. God 
will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He could have thought that, hey, if I mention God here, this might be my ticket out of here. I better don't spoil it. How many times you find yourself before your God and you had the opportunity to tell him about God? Say, ah, don't say, don't say church. Eh? Just mm, James, don't spoil it here. Just shut up. Don't let the people in your village follow you here. You have come this far. Don't spoil it. He was not ashamed because he has learned that man can fail you. So he was not looking to Pharaoh. He was looking to God. He said, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh did not say, Why did you mention God? Pharaoh said, Look, you have the solution. I beg, talk. I will listen. Pharaoh, he humbled himself before Joseph. And what happened? What happened? The rest is history. But you know one thing about when you have gone through your waiting room, when you have gone through process, it will make some things happen for you that will shock you. You will get just like, you know, you know the, Egypt, the Israelites, when they were leaving Israel, the Bible says in Exodus that they plundered Israel with the favor of God all the wages of 430 years, they got it in one night. With interest, with everything, they ruined the economy of Egypt because of evil. They asked for their neighbors articles of silver, articles of gold, and they gave it to them. When God pays you, you will be surprised. Do you know that in one day, five things happened to Joseph. In that one day, five things happened to him. Number one, although Potiphar was the one that put him in prison, why didn't Potiphar say, Ogafero, I put him in that prison. He's my prisoner. It was my wife said, What happened to Potiphar that day? Potiphar. Because a higher authority came and nullified whatever put him in prison. And the other question I have for us is this How long was Joseph sentenced in prison? We were not told. Thank you. Most likely for life. So if God did not show up, you would have been ruined. So you might be in a situation that looks as if this is your destination. But God will show up today. He will turn your story around. You will have testimony. That situation will flip like a switch all of a sudden. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream dreams. That is what will happen to somebody this morning. In the name of Jesus. So number one, what happened to Joseph? He was released from prison. But you know one thing? There's a difference between when a man is released from prison and when his criminal record is wiped off, it's different. Because you could be released, but then when you go and open the book, he was prisoner 101 in 1945. So he's still a prisoner. He can't contest for whatever. But that day, Pharaoh gave him clemency. So his prison record wiped off. So if Mr. Butler had remembered him two years ago, he would have been released, but would still have been criminal record would still be there. But because it was Pharaoh that was in charge now, he released him and he wiped off his criminal record. That's the second thing that happened. Number three, you know what happened on that day too? On that same day, he was made an Egyptian. He got citizenship that day. He didn't go and do tests. He didn't go and do English tests. How many of you did English tests? He didn't do all those things. He didn't go and do IELTS. He didn't go and waste his time. He said, you are too good not to be an Egyptian. They, they gave him citizenship on a platter of gold. And that was not all. Number four, they made him the prime minister in that day. He didn't contest. He didn't campaign. He didn't have delegates. He was not liberal. He was not green. He was not socialist. He was a man who stood with God. That is what will happen if you stay in your waiting room. If you stay there, stay there gently. Your day is coming. Your day is coming. You will come out of nowhere. You overtake every Arab to the gate of Jezreel. And to now crown with all. To now crown with all. Number five. Who knows what happened to him? Number five. He got a wife. He got a wife. Sarah, he, got a, he didn't have to say, excuse me, I love you. You know, my name is Joseph. I can ah. Pharaoh said, you are too good not to have a wife. We'll give you one. In one day, five things happened to him. Number one, he was released. He was pardoned. He became an Egyptian. He became the prime minister. He got a wife. Only one day. What is five? Five is the number of grace. When you wait in your waiting room, grace is released. Grace for the impossible. Grace to take you to the next level. That grace is coming upon somebody this morning. In the name of Jesus. Grace for the impossible. We all want grace. But we have to wait. You have to wait. I implore you brothers and sisters. It may look long. It may look hopeless. It may look lonely. It may look isolated. 
But don't give up on God. Because he will not give up on you. Because his word will not return to him void. But he will prosper whatsoever he sent. And accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Let's rise up on our feet this morning. Let's rise up on our feet this morning. I want us to begin to bless the name of the Lord. Let's bless his name. He's a faithful God. The waiting room. If you walk along with God, you will find yourself in the waiting room. That's not where you are going. It is just a bus stop. It is not your destination. I want us to speak to God this morning. I don't know what your waiting room is. Our waiting rooms are different. Yours may be financial. It could be relational. It could be business. It could be whatever. I want us to ask God to forgive us in whatever areas we've despised our waiting room. Because we've been taught what we despise, what we despise, I beg your pardon, cannot confer benefit on us. Let's ask God for mercy this morning. Have mercy on me. I am sorry, Lord. I did not know it was a waiting room. I have despised it. Let's ask him. In case you know the areas you have messed up, ask him for mercy. Ask him for mercy. We saw what Joseph went through. He was despised. He was cheated. He was manipulated. He was pressured. He had so many things go wrong. His brothers betrayed him. He was so like a commodity. He went through so many things. But by his grace, he hung on to the world. He hung on to purpose. He did not give up. He did not stop. He trusted God who had promised. And we saw the end. In the end, grace manifested. Grace manifested. Grace showed up. That God is in the house this morning to heal, to deliver, to give you your destiny. Please don't give up on God. Your future is brighter than you ever think. Don't let anybody deceive you. Don't let anyone tell you that you are man to nothing. Don't let anyone tell you that this is it for you. No, no. You are a child of the most high. Greater is he that is on your inside than he that is in the world. You are the child of the king. You are born to shine. You are born you, you, you are meant you are, his, you are his workmanship to show forth his good, to broadcast it to the nations. That's why he made you. You are not an afterthought. You are not an afterthought. You are an important person in, in, in God's plan. I want us to ask him this morning. Even after asking for mercy, the Lord keep me true till the very end. Keep me true. Don't let me fall by the wayside. Joseph stayed true to course. He stayed on course. And ultimately, all those 13 years of pain and grief turned into joy. He became the prime minister in Egypt. And if you read your Bible further, the Bible says he was teaching the senators of Egypt wisdom. He became father to Pharaoh. This was an Hebrew, but he was a foreigner. He was more foreigner than you and I. But God gave him grace. He gave him a voice and he began to sit with the nobles, with the people, and he began to teach them wisdom because he was a man who had gone to the waiting room, who had gone to process. He did not despise his process. Let's ask him, Father, I receive grace to finish strong. I will fulfill my destiny. I will fulfill my purpose. I will not fall by the wayside. I will not despise you. I will walk with you. Help me, Lord. Help me, Father. I ask for grace this afternoon. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I receive strength. Thank you, Father, for strengthening with might by your spirit in the inner man. And remember, Joseph did this under the old covenant that was faulty. We have a better covenant. We can do better. We can do better. Let's ask him. He's ready to deliver to save, to cause your money to turn into dancing. And I trust God. If we will believe with all of our hearts, we will have testimony. We will be testimony after testimony because it's a God that will do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can ever ask or think according to his power that works in us. Father, Lord, we thank you. We magnify you. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.